I believe that the God that we know, or the God that led the people that we see in Scripture, is to the same God today. Amen. And he would want us to know what made them experience what they, what they experienced. Sometimes, not that God has changed, but it is just that people, people don't look where God will expect them to look. Or people don't walk where God wants them to walk. So they don't really see what the great and mighty things that he intends to do. And today I want us to I want to bring our attention to something uh, in the book of First Chronicles. Something about King David. Um First Chronicles is a very wonderful book. We're going to be looking at something in First Chronicles chapter 14, from the verse 13. But I want us to just have a quick overview of this book. I'll be very brief today. I trust God. First Chronicles is a very interesting book. It begins with, with genealogy and uh, the, the family tree of the, of the, of the Israelites. And actually, it starts from Adam. And um, if you don't have, if you're not really persistent, you don't have any persistence in you, you go to chapter 4, chapter 5, you want to stop. Because just names after names after names, and it goes all the way through to chapter 10. And you wonder, what am I doing with all these names? What do you want us to do with them? I mean, just a, just a quick glance and you sometimes feel a bit discouraged. Now, why does the chronicler or the writer take pains to give us all this genealogy? Why? There's a reason <laughs> telling us of the unity of the, that the tribes had, the connection. They were all, I mean, how they were united. Because remember, chronicle records the, it was written for those returned captives. Should I say, well, those who had been taken into captivity in, in Babylon and have returned. So the account was being written for them. And they were being told of what God had done in the past. And here, when they come back, their, their family tree is being given out so they will know where they fit. And then afterwards, the, the writer tells them of the wonderful things that really happened. And one thing is most important to the writer. That you've returned from captivity. The first thing that is important is not the land. It's not how it's set in your, in your homes and all that. The first thing they get to doing is a temple. Let's get a temple work sorted out. That means faith, faith is most important for the people who have returned from captivity. If they're going to settle down in their country, see the glory of God, experience God as it ought to be seen then they need to recapture the covenant faith. They need to have an understanding of how their previous leaders walked with God. Because something happened. Other ancestors let, let, let them astray. That was the reason why they wanted into captivity. So if you've come back, then the first thing to get right is the covenant faith. Faith with Jehovah. It, that must be set right. So before you talk about your houses, your homes, let's get this in straight. Your covenant relationship, your covenant faith with Jehovah God. Get that one right. So here we see that as you go through the book, you realize his, his, his emphasis is telling them certain accounts. And in these accounts, he's telling them of the faith that some of the, the previous leaders had and how they work with God. And how they saw the 
goodness and the glory of God. Like David had victory upon victory. What was the cause for that? What led to that? Hallelujah. And this afternoon, I want us to quickly look at some of these things. To God be the glory. So as you go through the book, don't get discouraged at the first 10 chapters. <laughs> Have the perseverance and go beyond it. <laughs> For the, there is something, praise God. It's in So chapter 14, what I want to look at is after the event of David's attempt to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And I say, I use the word attempt because it was unsuccessful. And we need to know, because that's important, why he was not able to bring the ark into, the, into Jerusalem. Because the ark, we know, stood for the presence of God. It was a symbol of the presence, presence of God. He wasn't able to bring the ark. Um, why, was, why was he not able? There was something that David did. David put the, um, he got the ark from the house of Abinadab, from the city of Bala. He got the ark from there, and then he put the ark on a new wagon. Um, a little box with some wheels and then some uh, whether two cows or whatever oxen was before it and then they had uh, I think two riders they had um, um, Uzzah was one of the riders on the cows or the cattle whatever it was and the cat was behind now as as um, as providence will have it as they were journeying, <laughs> the cattle stumbled. So the ark was about to fall. And Uza, one of the drivers, tried to, you know, uh, I don't know whether I tried to turn to secure the thing or whatever. Some people think that Uza was just dancing around the cat. No, no, no. He was a driver. Let's read it. Let's read it. Let's go to first. Uh, let's go to chapter um, 13, verse 6 and 7. Before we come to this. 13, 6, and 7. I read. First Chronicles 13, 6, and 7. Okay. And David went up and all Israel to Bala, that is to Kejab Jerem, which belonged to, the, to Judah, to bring up the ark of God. Sorry, to bring up thence the ark of God, the Lord. To bring up thence the ark of God, the, the Lord, that dwelt between the cherubims, whose name is called upon it. Right? Verse 7. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart, or in a new wa wagon, out of the house of Ab Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio drove, uh, drove the cart. Right. So, they had put the, the ark on the new wagon, I mean, brand, brand new. And um, Uzzah tried to secure the ark in this place because it, uh, it almost fell down. And Bible says, God smote, God killed him. What happened, whether an instant disease or something, they knew it was because he touched the ark. I mean, it was very vivid. You can't escape that. God killed him right on the spot. And the reason was that he was not meant to touch the ark. He wasn't meant to touch it. Now, two things happen here. The people have returned from captivity and they've been told this. Why are they being given this information? So they would not repeat the same mistakes. So they would know that the ark of God must not be touched by certain people. Hello. It represented the presence of God. And certain people were supposed to touch it. 
and not certain people. Number one, the ark was never meant to be driven on a wagon, be it old or new. New didn't make any difference. It was meant to be carried by the Levites on their shoulders. So, uh, so Uzzah had no right to touch the ark. And God, God spells out, he, he, he spelled that, that message out so clearly. Now, let's read something in, um, let's go to chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. That God is the same God. Wonderful, powerful, glorious. But there are certain principles in God which needs to be understood and lived by. I mean, you can't, you can't go past it. What God has laid down, he has laid down. Now, verse 5. And David made him houses in the city of, of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched it for a tent. Verse 2. Then David said, none ought to carry the ark but the Levites. For them has the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God. And to minister unto him forever. Verse 13. Same chapter, verse 13. Which says. For, for because ye did it. Ye not at first. Because ye did it not at first. The Lord our God made a breach upon us. For that we sought him not after the due order. So because the Levites, they, we didn't seek his right way, how to really go about bringing this ark to Jerusalem. We thought, you know, it's the ark of God. I mean, uh, we can bring the, the, the ark of God to Jerusalem. I mean, God knows we are his people. And God, God knows all of us. I'm, and I'm the king. And I can bring the ark. So they went, put it on a new wagon, thinking they, they're giving God the best. God, I... I I am not bothered by new. The thing is that it did not go the way it was supposed to be done. It's as simple as that. Oh God, we've got innovative ideas. Uh -uh. It's not your innovation. It's what I have laid down. Because I've got principles I go by. So you don't violate them and say, oh, we all know God. Yes, we all know God. But God has set that certain people do certain things. And then others do other things. To God be the glory. So what we see. What we see here is. They, those who have returned. Need to take cues from this. And not repeat it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, what lesson, so the lesson we see here is this. That we are to approach divine things with deep respect. Hallelujah. Deep respect here means the way God has set it to be done, that is the way we ought to approach it. And not to think that we can devise other means or, you know, change things around. And it has to be the way God wants it done. That is respect for what God has laid in place. Hallelujah. I am talking about God generally. Amen. That he is still the same God. He wants his people to experience him. That is the bottom line. He wants them to experience him. And there is no, there's, there is nothing else here. He wants his people to experience him. But the mistakes of the past don't. Do you know why God will reveal certain weaknesses in the a, in a Bible to us? So we will not repeat them. So it's for our benefit. So we will enjoy God. So, we will, so we, will, we will experience the wonderful, glorious things that God has in store for us. Amen. So what, we, what we're saying here is this. He expects us to take to do what he has given us to, to, to do 
with great seriousness. So if God put something in your hands to do, you are to do it with great seriousness. Because he has appointed you to do it. Hallelujah. If he assigned you to do something, give it your best. Hallelujah. Not like, you know, um, oh, well, this is, the, this, this is the work of God. I mean, God, God is spirit. All, all he cares about is the inside. So, no, no. God, God wants it to be done excellently. And in the way that will bring, that will bring pleasure to him. Amen. Now, it, it should not, we should not also have the idea that anybody can handle anything. No. That is clear in this instance. There are some things that God has said that you do. And you do it. Amen. So if he appoints you to do something, you be there and get it done. Praise God. Oh, uh, I'm not there. Let this one do it. No. Did God say him or he said you? So if he said you do it, you be there and do it. Because God knows why. In his wisdom, he knows why he apportioned you to do it. Amen. So basically... If we want to see, I believe that God wants to manifest his glory. And we, we, need, to, we need to position ourselves or we need to, to, um, to, to put, to put the, the respect and the, yeah, the respect and the reverence for what God has put in place where it ought to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. He said, where is this in the Bible? Uh, uh, okay, I'll give you a, an example. I'll give you an example. Because um, this principle we, we are talk, talking about, God set it, um, God gives a very clear picture or we see the seriousness of this principle very clearly in the life of uh, King Saul. And I want to bring his story up. In 1 Samuel 13 verse 5. 1 Samuel 13 verse 5. We will read um, through verse 5 to 14. I'll just read through. First. Samuel 13, 5 to, 4, 5 to 14. And the, Phil and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came and pitched in Michmash, eastward from Bethaven. When the men of Israel saw that they were, in, they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves. That's the Israelites. They hid in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Israel was afraid. And he tarried, verse 8, and he tarried seven days according to the statement of us. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. Verse 9. And Saul so said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. 
And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him, a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord has commanded you. Hmm. You see, earlier on, it says very, very clearly that King Saul waited according to the time appointed by Samuel. So he waited. He did not go beyond the time. Or he, he did not sacrifice before the time. He waited for the appointed time. Seven days he waited. But Samuel did not show up according to the appointed time. So it was Samuel's fault. Samuel delayed in coming. But you see, although Samuel delayed in coming, the blame is not put on Samuel. The blame is put on Saul. Because Saul said, I forced myself. Hello. He forced himself and offered the burnt and the peace offering. When Samuel shows up, he says, you've done foolishly because you have not kept the command. But he kept the seven days. But when did God tell him to wait seven days? When? I'll show you something. Come to chapter, chapter 10, verse 6 to 8. Same Samuel. Chapter 10, 6 to 8. Okay. Here, from the onset, when Saul was, an, uh, was, was, was put in office, right from the onset, he was given the instructions. So these were not instructions that was given later on. It was part of the early instruction that Samuel received. Right. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And thou shalt prophesy with them. And shall be turned into another man. You remember this so clearly? This was the beginning of Saul's reign. Okay. Verse 7. And let it be. When these signs are come unto thee. That thou do as occasion serve thee. Do as occasion Serve thee. When you see these signs. Verse 7. When you see these signs. Do as occasion serve thee. For God is with you. So as the, as the occasion demand. As the spirit of God will move you. Do. So at one time. When the people of Jabesh Gilead said, Saul, we need your help. God, they, they want to take us captive. The Bible said that the Spirit of God came upon Saul. And he killed an oxen and, and brought it into pieces. And then said, send this to all the tribes. That anyone who does not come, that's what will happen to him. And the people rallied and came round. Because that was the Spirit of God upon him. Hallelujah. That was not real power. That was the spirit of God upon him. Rallying the people together. Then in verse 8. Something was said. Thou shalt go down to Gilgal. So thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold. I will come down unto you. To offer burnt offerings. And to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offering. Seven days shalt thou tarry. Till I come to thee. 
and show thee what thou shalt do. So this was clearly laid out. As occasion serve thee, do what needs to be done for the Spirit of God, for God is with you. But seven days go to Gilgal, right? Don't just jump into the wall. Go to Gilgal and wait for seven days. And I will come and I will be the one to perform the sacrifices. And I will tell you what you should do. Now back to Chronicles chapter 13. Oh, sorry. Now back to the first Samuel. First Samuel 13. Let me just finish up with this. First Samuel 13. Verse 7. Verse 7. It says, And some of the Hebrews went over to Jordan, the land of God, and, and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal. So, he followed the first part of the commandment. And the people followed him trembling. So, he was in Gilgal. And verse 8, he tarried. How many days? Hello? He tarried seven days. As Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. So he had obeyed, gone to Gilgal, waited seven days. Now the people were scattering. So he decided, I need to do this bit. Because he has been with Samuel for a while now. He's been king for a while now. He has seen how Samuel had done it. He's been there. I mean, Samuel had done it several times, so he has seen the process. I mean, he knows how it is, it, it is done. So he can do it because he knows the whole thing, the whole, how, the beginning to the end. He knows the, all the process. Church, let me say something. It is not about familiarity with the process. Hello. It is not about familiarity with the process. It's not about how it's all done. How familiar, how confident you are with the process. But has he told you to do it? Has he told you to do it? That is the main issue. So Saul was conversant with the issue, with the, with the whole process. So he thought it was just about, it was just about just putting the thing to, together. So he done a sacrifice, done, done everything. And then just before he finished, just before he finished, it looked like he was being, he was being tried. Samuel shows up and says, you have done foolishly. Why? You have done what you should not have done. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. So, uh, Samuel's delay or mistake has got nothing to do with your obedience. Hello? Hello? Samuel has delayed. So obviously Samuel is at fault. But it, got, it, it, it has got nothing to do with Saul's obedience. What God has said you do. Let God deal with Samuel for his lateness. God will deal with you on your grounds. So he's late. Let it, let it be so. Hello. To God be the glory. So it is not about ability. It is not about ability. Or how conversant you are, you are with the whole drill. But what God has said, or who God has said, must do A and must do B. What I'm saying tonight, or this, 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 this afternoon, is that God has assigned you to certain things to do. And you are meant to do it. Praise God. What God has positioned you to do, don't say, oh, oh, oh I, 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 I'm just taking my leave. You, you carry on. I mean, it just, it's just, it's just, no, God wants you to do it. Because in the wisdom of God, he set it up that you do it. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to say this afternoon is that let's take what God has said seriously. 
Because that is what he wanted the people to understand. That you've come. You've come back. You need to now understand the, co- I mean the, the covenant God. And let's establish faith first. Your relationship. Let's establish your covenant faith first. Understand how God wants things done. And I believe that if we need this message, if we need it any time, I think it is today. We need it today than ever before. Because today, people have become so conversant with the house of God and with the things of God and the way things are done, all because in the name of grace. Oh, we can all do it. Everybody can do it. I mean, it's just, it's not a matter of ability and com- how conversant you are with the thing, but what God has said. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Okay. So, now, 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 now let me move on to the chapter 14. Let's move on to chapter 14. Chapter 14. First Chronicles 14. Are you there? Right. First Chronicles 14. Here, verse 14. There's something very interesting here. And it says, Therefore, David inquired again of God. And God said unto him, Go not up after them. Turn again, turn away from them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. This is what I really wanted to key in into, that David inquired again. But then, as I was looking at the book itself, I couldn't escape the fact that in chapter 13, something happens there. <laughs> Praise God. I couldn't just, 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 just walk over, over that. I need to comment on that fact that something happened in chapter 13, which we need to look at before we come here. 14, the Bible says, David inquired again. And inquired again, meaning he has inquired before. He had made inquiries before. Because what I see here is similar to what we've just dealt with in chapter 13. It's very, very similar. The same thing is running through. He inquired again. Now, let's read the whole, let's take it, let's read the whole thing. From verse 13. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, verse 13. And the Philistines yet again spread themselves abroad in the valley. So the Philistines have come against David. Therefore, David inquired again of God. Now, the first time, you remember when David was in trouble, he went to seek help. Uh, he went to hide in the Philistines' <laughs> country. And now when they, they learned that he had, he, had, he had become king. So when they realized that he has become king, they went to seek him. Basically, the the seeking was not to inquire good from him. They want to bring him down. So David asked the Lord, God, what should I do? God said, go after them. So he went after them and chased them out. You know, the Philistines, they are are like the devil, you know. He comes once and (laughs) he chases him. He comes again. He's got persistence. And... uh, um, I pray that we will learn that kind of persistence <laughs> where we don't back off. So, they come again. And when he comes again, what does David do? David does not say, oh, when they came, I asked God. And um, God said, chase them. And they're the same people. So, when they've come, I'll go, I'll go after, 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 after them again. No, David did not do that. He went to ask God again. That is a key, that's, a, that, that's my main point here. He asked God again, same people. He did not take it for granted that because he has asked first and God said go after them, 
God will second, God will again say, go after them. He sought God again. Should I go again? Should I go? He sought, he sought, he sought God. And this time when God did not just say go. This time when God gave him a plan. Let's watch it. Verse 14. Go not up after them. Turn away from them. And come upon them over against the marble trees. And it shall be when thou shalt hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt go out to battle. For God is gone forth before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. Hallelujah. God still fight for his people. Hallelujah. God still fight for his people. Whatever it is around, God is still fighting for his people. And all we need to do is to find out what he's doing this time around. Because he might have a different strategy altogether. Different plan. David did not take it for granted. Now because God told me to go after them the first round, this time when I would just go in my own, no, he still sought God. What needs to be done? And God showed him what to do. Often time, you know, we just take it for granted. That once God has opened this door, then, you know, I must go through it and I can take no. He has opened the door for you. But God wants to walk the journey with us. Amen. He's walking the journey with us. And at each point in time, we need to be liaising with him. Asking God, what is it? Hello? Hello? So here we see that, verse 16, David therefore did as God commanded him, and they smote the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even to Gaza. They smote them. They dealt with them. So shall God Almighty grant us victory. Hallelujah. So here we, we see that David's victory is linked with his submission to the Lord. It is linked with his submission. He did not take it for granted that because I am king and God has called me to fight his battles, I will just get up and go. Hello. The popular thing today is, you know, if God wants to speak, he will speak. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not stopping him. If God wants to speak to me, he will speak to me. I don't need to ask him because asking him is, um, uh, asking him is trying to, trying to, um, uh, it's like um, I'm asking for too much. So if God will speak to me, he will speak to me. So I'll, I'll just go on and do whatever needs to be done. So I guess go ahead and do it. Hello. If he doesn't speak, then it means that he's in favor of it. If he, if he, doesn't, if he doesn't want me to do it, he will, he will stop me. If God doesn't want me to, me, me to do it, he will stop me. I don't need to ask him. He will just stop me and say, don't do it. Just stop. Because he is God. Hello. So I don't need to, I, I don't need to really ask, I, I don't need to really ask God. I guess go ahead and do it. Hello. I know God's spirit lives inside of us. He dwells with us. Hello. He dwells with us. David. David in Psalm 27. One of the reasons why he sought to dwell in the house of God was this. Psalm 27 verse 4. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after and I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And to inquire in his temple. Right. I want to 
bring us something here. Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. Joshua 1 verse 5. When God called Joshua, chapter 1 verse 5. What did God tell Joshua? Can we all read in concert? There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee and will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Now, just after God says that, chapter 7, verse 2. Chapter 7, verse 2. What we see here. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people labor with, with that, for they are but a few. So they went up thither of the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them. The, in the, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Hasn't God said, no man shall stand before Joshua? Hello. God has said, no man shall stand before you. And here, Joshua send the men out to war against a small town and they are smitten big time. Now, when Joshua gets this, it doesn't go down well with Joshua. And I'm sure if it was you, it wouldn't go down well because when God has given you a sure promise that no man shall be able to stand against you in battle, you have victory upon victory upon victory. Hallelujah. And now you go, your men go and now they are struck down in battle. And what happens? So when they come, now let's take it from the verse 6. Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face. Before the ark of the Lord, until the even time, he and the elders, elders of Israel and put dust upon their head. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, where has, wherefore hast thou brought us all as Thou at all brought these people over to Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorite, to destroy us. Would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan? Oh Lord God, oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us and cut off your, our name from the earth. And what would thou do unto thy great name? Let me say this. Joshua did in the end what he should have done at the beginning. Inquired. What he done at the end should have been done at the beginning. Should have inquired. But he inquired at the end. So he was the other way around. And I realized that this is very, very common with us. You know? After we've run the race, after we've gone the thing and the thing out, he does bad. We now come to God and say, God, what is happening here? So it's like, what we should have done at the beginning, we do it at the end. And what we do at the end should have been done at the beginning. So God showed him what was wrong. God said, there's an Achan in the, in the camp. Someone had done what I said he should not do. When you went to Jericho. So if you had inquired, you would have known this and dealt with it before you went. That means God wasn't going to overlook when his commanded, when, he, when his command is, viol is violated. Just like in the case of Saul, God will not overlook. So basically, they took it for granted that hey, God has given them the victory. They've conquered and conquered and conquered. I mean, now God. We don't need to ask again. Let's just go. What should we do? What is the plan? How are we approaching it 
today? What are you saying today? What are you doing today? And God would have said, okay, today I'm doing A, B, C, D. But, you know, today, let Israel circumcise their, their hearts. <laughs> let, Israel, let everyone dig their grounds, and I'll show you something in the earth. Deal with it before you, before you, before you go out. They just went out. God have mercy. To God be the glory. So if we, if, if we would do, if we, if, if we would put, put things where they ought to be, not take things for granted, that you know, oh, we are born again, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, so let's just do it. Let's talk to the Lord. Let's ask the Lord. There's a project you want to run into. Oh, I am, I am born again. The Lord is with me. Run into it. Ask the Lord. What is it? How do you want me to go about this thing? And he will direct. Or else we will go and then when we come back and ask God, we will now come to inquire or do what we should have done at first. Money would have gone into the drain. Energies would have been spent. So many things would have been done. Labor. People would have been, I mean, you have, you have encouraged so many people into the, they would say, ah. So you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't really, God didn't tell you to do that. He made us do it. And now we are going all the way back. But God have mercy. So before you get the laborers on board, before you pay them so much money, find out what God is doing. For God still does the miracles he does. He still shows himself strong on behalf of them whose hearts are right towards him. He is mighty God. He is conqueror. He is deliverer. He is still strong. He is still able to do the mighty things. Hallelujah. To be honest with you, he is more than able. All he wants is that he be given the proper place, the proper respect. That we acknowledge him. That you are God. You have first place. We don't run the show. You don't run the show. So you tell what you want done. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter. It may be little, little things. Things with the family. Things with education. Things with the school. Whatever. Let's ask him. What you want done. How should we go about this? Let's talk to him. Amen. For God is more ready to show his glory. That's the reason why he will show us all these things. So we will know what to do. Hallelujah. In John 5, Jesus Christ said something. He said, John 5, 19. He says, he said, The son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For what things over the, he does, these also the son does likewise. Amen. So he does not do anything of himself. It is what he sees the father do that he does. Where we see the rumbling, where we see God working, that is where we work. Amen. The principles of God don't change. They're the same in the OT, they're the same in the NT. Let's find out. So God, we are moving into this. What is it? The world wants to say they are able, they are able to do it themselves because they've got the wits, they've got the strength, they've got every, every, everything. We say, God, you gave us the strength. He gave us the grace. We know there is an incredible great power in us. But this power is subject to your will. We do not control the power of the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. But you direct what we get involved and what we don't get involved in. The principles of God don't, don't change. They remain the same. Hallelujah. And sometimes Sometimes we will save ourselves some frustrations if only we will find out from him. 
Hello. We will save ourselves for frustrations. If only we'll find out. Paul realized there was a thorn in his flesh. Let's inquire and inquire and inquire until the Lord speaks up. Paul, Paul, Paul had a thorn in his, in his flesh. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 10, the Bible says, he said, he inquired, I inquired of the Lord three times. I want to believe that it was, it was the third time the Lord actually spoke up. He inquired of the Lord three times. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hello. So, he let you realize that, okay, if this is what God wants, then so be it. So he was not relaxed. So let's ask him, what is it? What about this? And keep asking. He said, well, it's not faith if you keep asking. Well, you, you have faith in him. That's why you keep asking him. Hello? So keep asking him. And he will show it. So we will save ourselves all the frustration. Now, why is this not going on? So once he shows you, you're okay. Praise God. What I'm saying is that let's ask him things. Let's talk to him about things. Let's not just take it for granted. For taking for granted a serious business. David also at one point took God for granted. He did not accept what God has given him by grace and went to take something God has not given to him. And he saw <laughs> the mighty hand of God come on his back. He took Uriah's wife. Something God has not given to him by grace. He did not. That David didn't get it right. And God's heavy hand came upon him. And he learned that he needs to accept what God has given to him by grace and walk in them. And things that God has not given to him by grace, but I'll give it to someone else. Let them walk in what God ever has given unto them. What I'm saying this afternoon is that there are some things God has given to you by grace. Walk in them. Be strong in them. Walk in them. Hallelujah. And what he has given someone else, let them walk in it. And let's respect what is given us to walk in. And let's do it as a divine, as, as something being done unto Jehovah God. And let's have respect unto what God has put in place everywhere. So if someone else has this one, we give you the full support in it. Another person is doing that hey, because we know God has said it so. And if you're doing it, you do it with all your mind, with all your strength. For God has graced you to do it. Hallelujah. And also, and also, let's not take it for granted. That because we are born again, we could get into anything. But talk to the Lord about it. Find out what he wants done. Amen. For the Lord desires to show us the way to go. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May be God's way of helping you lift up a big project up is to give away all the money you have. Say that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's God's way. Naturally, if you do that, you go bankrupt. But what if that is God's way? You only find out if you ask Him. I gave that example because that is, that is the most ridiculous thing you can ever think of in terms of business. But that's why I gave there. That when you're asking Him, He may tell you to go that, that like He told David. Don't go in front of them. 
go behind them. He may tell you to go another way. To God be the glory. Let's not take things for granted. Let's have deep respect for what, for what God has had in place. And let's give him his place. First place. Amen. In every situation, in everything, let's ask him. Let's ask him. Let's ask him. I keep pressing this point because I know it. Hello. I know it's sometimes you just feel to just ask him. Sometimes you just find it, you just feel to just ask him. And he just run into the thing. And then midway, you realize you're beaten more than you can handle. Let's ask him. Let's it is, it is an art. It is a skill. Let's, let's develop it. Let's practice it often. Let's act as children. That will make us act like babies. Yeah, but we are God's children. <laughs> and God wants us to be like children, be, children before him. So we ask him everything. God will not say, oh, you, you, you grow up. Do it your own way. He won't tell you that. You'll be glad that you're always inquiring of him. For that, that rather is maturity. Praise God. That rather is maturity. Amen. God bless. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you will enable us to practice this. We will not run ahead of you in, any, in nothing. But in every way, we will ask of your counsel. We will ask of your counsel in every way. Whatever we need to get into, we will not forget to ask you. We will not take it for granted. And things concerning your house have deep reverence for them. Have deep reverence for them, deep respect for them. What you've put in place, what you've set up, we will respect it. And what you've commissioned us to do, Lord, we will take it seriously and do it with all our mind, with all our strength. If anything new comes up, Lord, we will inquire from you. Holy Spirit, help us. In our weather, in our homes, concerning our schoolwork, concerning our job. So whatever we are involved in, career, whatever we are involved in, Lord, we will inquire of you. And we will inquire and inquire until we hear definitely what you want us to do. For you speak and you want to reveal things to us. May we come to this place. Thank you, Father, for your grace upon our lives in this area. In Jesus' name, amen.